All right, shalom, shalom, everybody. It's your boy Prophet uh, coming with another another message. Uh, this is my second video uh, using Zoom, so I'm still getting getting used to it, but I like it because not only does it keep the video aspect and you can see me, but I can use my home computer to share my screen and share exactly the information that I'm reading off of, so it helps the readers too as well. That way, when I go back and have to edit the videos, I don't have to, you know, put the scriptures up there, and that takes a lot of time. So this is this is really really helpful. Um, before we get into the lesson, um, if you look right behind my head, as you can see, the album is out um, on Bandcamp release. I gave it a week early release, but it'll be out on the twenty third of this month on all digital platforms: Apple Music, iTunes, Spotify, Pandora. Um, any any of those that you can think of, it'll be out. It's a good album. If you want early release on it, go ahead and um, I'll actually put the link to the Bandcamp below. It's a dope album. Put a lot of work into it. I'm real proud of it. So all praises to the Most High for his his his, his words, his ministry, the ability to touch people and affect them in such a way that you know moves the spirit. Um, creates edification, you know what I'm saying? So I'll press to the most high for that. All right, so getting into this um, topic, right? We're going to talk about Christianity, okay? And now this isn't going to be one of those um, Christian bashing videos or anything like that. That's not what I'm about. That's not what I'm trying to do. However, I am trying to raise awareness, right? Um, because there is a lot of misunderstanding, confusion, and just ignorance uh, when it comes to um, dealing with the origin of things. So quick background, right? For those of you guys who don't know, Christianity is a religion. It's the world's biggest religion. That and um, I believe Muslim, I believe. Okay. So a little background about me. I was a Christian for a long time. I was heavy, heavy in Christian ministry until... I was able to get stationed in Turkey unaccompanied, which means that I didn't have my family with me. I didn't have any Christian influence on my life. Um, I wasn't surrounded by Christians like I was back home. It was just me and it was just me by myself and the most high. And I was reading and I started to read the Bible with new eyes, started to see contradictions with what the scripture said and what my religious belief was at the time. And upon a lot of study, a lot of reading, a lot of um, prayer, um, a lot of discerning, and a lot of debating, because I was I was defending the Christian faith hard. Um, I came to the conclusion that um, the Christian religion just didn't align with the Bible, and so I was forced to make a decision. You know, do I stay? in a Christian mindset and you know, continue to be a part of a religion that doesn't even necessarily align with the scripture that I'm reading, right? You know, if you believe the Bible to be true and that we're supposed to follow the instructions within the Bible, we can't let man's interpretation of the Bible overrule what the Bible actually says. So I had to cut it, I had to let it go so I left Christianity. Um, I got caught up in Hebrew, being a Hebrew Israelite for like a small, a small period of time. It was probably like two months. Um, but then I started to see flaws in, in that doctrine as well. And so I just left religion altogether. Um, I followed the Bible. I studied the Bible. I'm a steward of the Bible. Um, and then I just, I follow, the, I follow what the word say, and I serve the most high. So that's where I'm at today. For the last, it's going on three years now, I'm just a child of the most high, servant, keeper of the Torah, all of that, you know. So um, when it comes to Christians, because since I came out of Christianity, you could say I have an affinity for Christians. Because I was there, and I understand why a lot of them believe what they believe. 
uh, uh, why a lot of them are so passionate about what they're passionate about because you know so was I at one point in time. So I try to like re you know reengage with uh, people I was cool with before, and you know just just as I see Christians come along, you know I try to you know have dialogue with them. So this this presentation is going to go into the origin of well, not the origin of Christianity, but something to think about in regards to the origins of Christianity. Because technically, the word Christian derives from Christ, right? Christian supposedly means follower of Christ. That's like the basic um, meaning for it, right? But when you look further, you look deeper, you actually do some scholarship, you notice a few things um, in the translation. And I'll also bring to light um, some, some more information in regards to um, some pagan connection. And then we'll watch a video and then I'll come back. We'll probably close it out because I don't want this video to be too, too long. So without further ado, I got, you're going to see two of Kings on here. One of Kings is just what I'm using from my home computer. I'm going to be screen sharing. And then the other one is the video and the audio that you see here because I don't have a webcam right now. So, all right, I'm about to share my screen so we can get started. And you'll see me throughout, and you'll hear me, hear me throughout now the commentary. So you guys can see what I'm seeing. Origins of Christianity, a dive into the pagan connection and translational understandings. All right, so it started because I saw a video and it was talking about um, Christianity and its origins and pagan connection, all that. And of course, I just took the video and put it in Microsoft Word form and regurgitated everything you said. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> so I fact checked. I went, I watched the video. The video was intriguing, but I went back, did my own research, fact checked it, and to see if you know what it was talking about was true or not. And through my research, I went and then I created this Microsoft Word. So all the information here you'll see. All right. So I saw the video, did my research, back check, and then this is what I was able to confirm. Okay. All right. So no offense to, to, to Christians, right? But anytime you see me write the word Christian, or anytime you see me write the word of any like pagan god, pagan deity, I always use um lowercase. Actually, one of them slipped past. It must have been an autocorrect right here. Let me fix that. All right. So this ain't me taking shots at Christians, but once you finish, once we finish this lesson, you'll see why I throw the word Christian um, into the category of lowercase, not uppercase. All right. So Christians of today use the name Christ and believe to be followers of him. Right. Right. Well, there's only two spots in the whole Bible that mentions the word Christian. Okay, and one of them is Acts 11 and 26, and it says, and when he had found them, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, I'm going to highlight this right here. And the disciples were called first Christians in Antioch. Keep that in mind. They were called that. That's not saying that the disciples went by that or that the disciples accepted that title, that name. You'll see exactly what I mean. All right. So, but the original followers of Christ would not wish to be called that name. Here is why. Okay. So we're going to look into the translations. Christ in the Strong's Concordance is 5546. And it also, when it's, when it's translated, is Christianos, right? So you see Christianos here, Christianos here. This is directly from the Strong's Concordance, right? No tampering or anything like that. That's why this is capitalized because this is coming from the Strong's. I don't capitalize, but the Strong's do, okay? All right, so original word, you got this, part of speech. You know, if y'all familiar with the Strong's Concordance, you know what all of this is. Definition of Christian, usage of Christian. All right. Word origin from Christos, definition of Christian. All right. So it's derived because it's, it's word origin from Christos, derived from 5547. Christos. Christos 
okay? Christos means the anointed one, Messiah Christ. All right, simple. The anointed one, Messiah Christ. So we keep going down. Word origin from Creo. And which derives from 5548, Creo. What a Creo, what does Creo mean? Creo means to anoint, okay, to anoint. Usage, I anoint, consecrate by anointing. Just to anoint. To anoint by rubbing or pouring olive oil on someone to represent the flow or empowering of the Holy Spirit or the, um, the Ruach, the Ruach HaKadosh, okay? Anointing literally involves rubbing oil, uh, olive oil on the head, etc., especially to present someone as divinely authorized or appointed by the Most High, to serve as a prophet, priest, or king, etc. And these are the scriptures that can, um, can prove that, right? So these are references, okay, references. And then it says uh, word origin, a prime word, meaning that this, is, this word doesn't have an origin. This word doesn't go, isn't derived from another word. This is the uh, origin word that these other uh, Christian, uh, Christianos and Creos and all of that, is, they come from this word, all right. So basically, Christ is the anointed one of the Most High in the scriptures, according to these Greek translations. But the issue lies in the translation, as the original language is Hebrew, which means the texts have been translated from Hebrew. If you look at the book of Matthew, it was originally written in Hebrew, and where the KJ version, uh, KJ King James Version, had Christ. The Hebraic original word used is Mashiach or Messiah. Never was he referred to as Christ by those whom, this is supposed to be whom, we're going to fix this as we go, uh, those whom lived during that time. So Christ cannot be his name or title. And what I mean by that is you have, so, so you have different translations, right? If, if, uh, a, if a book or a manuscript came out of Greek, out of out of the Greek culture, came from Greece, it's probably going to be written in Greek, right? That doesn't mean that the culture or what where that manuscript came from was actually Greek. So even if you had a Hebrew culture, a Hebrew uh, manuscript or some form of text, they had to translate it. They had to translate it. And then present it in the language in which the people who was going to read it from their from their uh, area had to read it to understand it. So it has to be Greek. Now people argue that the New Testament was written in Greek, but there are archaeological, um, historical, and contextual evidence that proves that the New Testament or majority of the New Testament was written in Hebrew rather than Greek. But we're going to continue on, all right? So if you look in the Hebrew translation of Messiah, you will see the Hebrew word Mashiach, right? Strong's 4899, Mashiach. Mashiach, it means anointed. So it's similar or the same as the, the Greek translation, right? Okay, so continue, continue, uh, con continuing on. Transliteration, Mashiach. Definition, anointed, right? Definition, anointed. And then you have the anointed, anointed, anointed ones, Messiah, uh, which derives from Hebrew 4886, Mashak. Okay, let's go to 4886, Mashak. To smear, anoint. To smear or anoint. Definition to smear and anoint. Anoint, anointed, uh, anointing, oil, painting, spread. So we can clearly see that Christ, the Greek word Christianos, Christos, Creo, was originally translated from the Hebrew word Mashiach or Mashak because they have parallel meanings. But when we, but when trying to find the truth of something, you must always go with the original text or language. And what I mean by that is, if you're going to create an entire religion. Okay, an entire religion 
one of the world's biggest religions, why would you pick a Greek translation that's only mentioned in the entire Bible twice over something along the lines of the original language, which would be Hebrew? That doesn't make sense. That's like if somebody created a religion based on Egypt but they called that religion something from, let's use Russia, for example. Let's call it Russian, right? So Russian is the religion, but the, the religion originated in Egypt. So why should it, why it doesn't have a Russian name as opposed to a Egyptian name? You see what I'm saying? Um, all right, so continuing on. There was also a pagan deity called Serapis, who was worshipped by individuals who called themselves Christians or Christos by the Romans and other people of that day during early third century AD. All right, so followers of Serapis called Christian link. This is the link to it. Let me see. I think I can share my screen and just switch it up really quick. All right, so. New share. We gonna hit. Share. share. All right. So. Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait a minute. Stop here. All right, so Serapis, the Composite God by Jimmy Dunn, writing as Jefferson Montana. Okay, so Serapis, see, this is the link. You click on that link, it takes you to this. All right, um, so it says, simply put, Serapis was, a, was an invented God. He was a composite of several Egyptian and Hellenistic deities who was introduced to the world at the beginning of the, the Ptolemaic uh, Greek period in Egypt during the reign of the Ptolemy. Uh, Though his legacy lasted well into the Roman period, thus he was meant to form a bride between the Greek and Egyptian religion in a new age in which their respective gods were brought face to face with each other so that both Egyptians and Greeks could find union in a specific uh, supreme entity. Okay, it was basically the god's name was a fusion of Osiris and the bull Apis, right? It was, it was a combination of that. And then uh, Serapis was basically a shorter rendition of the, the name that you get when you, you mix the two together. You got different you know, pictures and all that good stuff, right? So you have um, worship, worship of Serapis. Um, you had a, a, a cult that followed Serapis, okay? And they were, they, were, they were devout, they were legit. But I wanted to focus on here, early Christianity. It says Serapis may have finally had certain ties with the early Christian community. There were certainly some similarities between Serapis and the Hebrew God. Serapis was a supreme God, and it seems that some early worshipers of Christ amongst the Gentiles could have possibly worshipped Serapis either purposefully or confusing him with Christ. Though the confusion seems more likely to have been one of language, right? Here's another bit, uh, image of a correspondence of Emperor Hadrian refers to, Ale to Alexandrian worshipers of Serapis calling themselves bishops of Christ, okay? And here is the um, correspondence excerpt of correspondence, okay? In Egypt, Egypt, which you commended to me, my dearest uh, Servanius, I have found to be wholly fickle and inconsistent and continually wafted about by every breath of fame. The worshipers of, of Serapis here are called Christians. And those who are devoted to the God Serapis, I find called themselves bishops of Christ. And this was uh, Hadrian to Servanius in 134 AD. And it's quoted by Giles um, right here. All right. So you got this right, here, right? They call themselves Christians. They call themselves bishops of Christ. And you, you, let's go back to, let's go back to the document. All right, scroll back up, all the way to the top. And, okay, 
back to Acts 11 and 26. Okay. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They were called Christians. Now, when you talk about the term Christian in regards to the Roman usage to the to, to pointed at the, the disciples of Christ, right? We know that that wasn't a positive term. It was a derogatory term. But this gives us insight even more so as to why it was a derogatory term, because during that same period, followers of a pagan deity were also called Christians. So could it be that the Romans were calling the followers of the Messiah purposefully the same as these pagan deity worshippers or this, this pagan cult who worship this, this false god, this false deity called Seraphos during that time. Another indication is because Seraphos worship, right? And they were being, they, uh, this, this worship was instituted before the Messiah was even born, okay? So before you had, you know, what the, the four, the, the grandfathers of the modern day Christian church, what they were, or to before that even was established, you had this pagan cult worshiping Serapis before all that. And so Rome, the culture of Rome, they they would have already had this, this um Serapis worship influence already established. And so by calling the followers of the Messiah Christians, they were insulting the Christians and essentially from my understanding, basically either one saying you're no better than the pagan cult or you're another pagan cult, or two, calling them that name on purpose to, you know, um, excite anger in them, right? Because just take, take a step back. If you take yourself back to the Messianic times, right? So you were one of the apostles one of the disciples, you're walking around and somebody called you a Christian. Mind you, you are a Hebrew, okay? The disciples were Hebrews. The Messiah was a Hebrew. The culture was Hebraic culture. You're a Hebrew. And somebody calls you a Christian, a Greek founded name, one, a pagan cult name, two. Would you take that in as a compliment, or would you take that in, in, in terms of them just, you know, saying that you are a follower of the Messiah when the Messiah wasn't wasn't even called Christ. He was the Messiah. He was the Hamashiach the, or the Mashiach, right? So if they're calling you something completely different than all of that, and it has nothing to do with you, why even acknowledge it, right? Why even acknowledge it? And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So let's continue on. Go back to let's go back to so so there was also a pagan deity there was also a pagan deity called Mithras or Mithras um, or Mithra in Rome whose followers rivaled the Christian religion called Mithraism and this is a wiki link. All right, and this is a wiki link. I got that too. Let me show y'all real quick. And I'm only going to this one just to show you that there was a religion that um, that combated, so to speak, combated Christianity. All right. Oh, what happened? What I do? Give me a new that. Here we go, you're back. Here we go. All right. So, so this is a wiki. Let me show you. So this link that I clicked on, Wikipedia, right? It's telling you all about the history of it. But I come down here. Did I pass it? Oh, 
long to cut past it. The hill is kind of far down. We can do this. Persecution and Christianization. Wow, that's a, that's a word. The religion and its followers faced persecution in the first century from Christianization. And Mithraism came to an end at some point between its last decade and the fifth century. Okay. It says, Ulanzi states that Mithraism declined with the rise of power of Christianity until the beginning of the fifth century. Christianity became strong enough to exterminate by force rival religions such as Mithraism. Okay. It says, according to Spedo, or Spedo, Christians fought fiercely with this feared enemy and suppressed it during the late fourth century. Uh, Mithriatic sanctuaries were destroyed and religion was no longer a matter of personal choice. According to Luther H. Martin, Roman Mithraism came to an end uh, with the anti-pagan decrees of the Christian emperor the the Theodosius uh, during the last decade of the fourth century. So you see that. So Mithraism was like, competition for Christianity, unfortunately lost. All right, so this is where we're at before. Mithraism and Christianity. Early Christian apologists noted similarities between Mithraic, uh, Mithraic or Mithraic, yeah, there we go, Mithraic and Christian rituals, but nonetheless took an extreme negative view of Mithraism. They interpreted Mithraic rituals as evil copies of Christian ones. For instance, for instance, Tertullian wrote that a prelude to the Mithraic initiation ceremony, the initiate was given a ritual bath and at the end of the ceremony received a mark on the forehead. He described these rites as a, di a diabolical counterfeit of the baptism and chrismation and if you click on Christmation, it shows you this, this, this video, this picture, right? It says, Chrism also called birth, very unholy, anointing oil, consecrated oil, okay, of Christian. Um, Justin Martyr contrasts Mithraic initiation communion with the uh, each Eucharist is a Christian rite that is considered a sacrament in most churches and as an ordinance in others, according to the New Testament. And it goes on, right? And then he wrote about these people. He wrote about these people. He, it says, he called them evil demons, you feel me? But I only mention this, and I don't go too, too deep into this. I only mention this because there was another religion that rivaled Christianity during that time. Eventually, Christianity got strong enough to do away with it as they did away with a lot of other religions. There is a very bloody history uh, rooted deep in Christianity. They don't talk about that, but we ain't going to get involved that. All right. So, due to the worship of Mithraism in the early Christian church, there is an indication that the two may have blended in ways as the birth of Mithros is depicted as being born from a rock slaughtering a bull and sharing a banquet with the god soul or the sun. Remember the empire of Rome were sun worshipers, okay? Which is why the Julian calendar and the later formed Gregorian or Greco-Roman calendar were solar calendars based, which based all time revolving solely around the sun, which is another reason for so many heliocentric pagan customs infiltrating the first Christian church, the Roman Catholic Church or the RCC. All right, so if you look at, see the research on the connection between the Roman Catholic Church and Mithras or Mithraism, and here's one right here. Um, and right now we're we'll gonna check out that video I mentioned. Uh, this video is gonna mention Mithras, right, in the connection between Mithraism and Christianity but it's also going to go into detail about the connection between Christianity and the worship of Serapis, the fallen deity. So let's check that out real quick and we'll get right back to here and we'll close it out because I don't want this video to be too long. See you in a minute. 
When was the word Christian first used as a believer of Christ? Acts 11.26, where it states, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The Greek word used in the passage is Christianos, meaning follower of Christ. If you do your research, you'll actually find that there's much information about the book of Matthew being written in Hebrew. George Howard published a book called The Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. In his book, he shows the original Hebrew version of Matthew on one side of the page and the English version on the other side. What I find amazing is that the word Messiah, which is actually Mashiach, is in almost every place where you see Christ in the King James Version. The early believers were called Christians or Christianos in the Greek and Aramaic manuscripts, but not in the Hebrew. The correct word would have been Masayak or Messiah, which is what the disciples, Hebrews, Judah or Yehuda, and early believers would have called the Savior. The word Christian and Christ originates from the Greek word Christos, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Masayak. Both words basically mean anointed. Hebraic Bibles restored the word to Messianics. What most modern Christians don't realize is that there was a deity by the name of Serapis, whose followers were called Christianos, Christians. As early as 200 BCE, there were pagan worshippers of Serapis that called themselves Christians. At the Vatican, this statue of the Roman pagan deity Mithras, with the words Crestos Mithras. Mithrasism was the main pagan religion of ancient Rome and became blended with the Messianics of Israel through the compromises of the Nicene Council, headed by Constantine and his son Crispus. The iconic scenes of Mithras show him being born from a rock, slaughtering a bull, and sharing a banquet with the god Sol, the sun. Thus we have a merge of the early church of Rome with Mithrasism, and forming the RCC, Roman Catholic Church. The early assembly of believers referred to in the Hebrew tongue as Messianics would not want to call themselves Christians or Christianos. They were called Christians or Christianos by non-believers and not by themselves. The true followers of the Messiah would not want to be called after the name of pagan worshippers of Serapis. These worshippers of Serapis had been calling themselves Christianos for more than two centuries before the Messiah was even born. It's obvious that the non-believers were confusing the Messianic believers with the worshippers of Serapis. This is how paganism got mixed into the truth. And just as Paul, Shaul had stated, the mystery of iniquity had already begun to work in his days. Why were the early believers called Christianos? A Greek word in Antioch. Antioch was an ancient Greek city. Only a Greek speaking person will call the followers of the anointed, the Messiah, the Mashiach, Christianos. Antioch was the capital of the Seleucid Empire and later became a major metropolis in the Roman Empire, the kingdom of the Edomites. All right, so as y'all can see in that video, um, like I said in earlier, you know, the worshipers of Serapis are Christians, but the, but the disciples, even the apostles after the, the after the um, Messiah's death and resurrection, they wouldn't have wanted to be called no Christian, even even if they spoke the Greek language. They understand that it originated in Hebrew. It was a Hebraic thing, right? So let's go ahead and read this part. Okay. Do you believe that the true worshipers of the Messiah would want to be called the same thing as the worshipers of a pagan false god, Serapis? Which is why we clearly see confusion in how the church adopted the word Christ and applied it to many Christian holidays, events, and sayings since its inception from the Greek translation. The early believers in Christ were Hebrew. The Messiah himself was Hebrew, and they all spoke the same language. 
they would have went by a Hebraic name, not a Greek. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Most High shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So people today use Christ for the name or title of the Messiah ignorantly because they are unaware of his origins. Let's go back to Acts 26 for a moment. Again, they were called. Christians first in Antioch. They were called Christians first in Antioch. And like the video stated, um, watch me Yahoo, I believe is his name. Antioch was a prominent, prominent Greek city and is known for pagan worship. Okay. When you look at the origin of Christian, the, the, the origin of Christianity. Now, this is an actual origin statement right here, right? The Christianity originated the religion of christianity originated in the roman catholic church the roman catholic church comes from its name rome it came from rome what was rome rome was a pagan society a pagan culture it it it, it worshiped multiple multiple pagan gods right so it was a polytheistic culture, meaning worship of more than one God. Monotheistic culture is worship of one God, right? So how do you generate a monotheistic religion from a polytheistic culture? It's, it's, it's unfounded, right? But that is why in the Christian religion, even though it's monotheistic in appearance it has many pagan ties to polytheistic um, tendencies and behaviors if you look deep into the into christianity right that's why a lot of christian um holidays aren't aren't based in the scriptures they're created right but if you look into some of the holidays for example christmas Christmas wasn't always called Christmas. It was Saturnalia. It was a Roman holiday, worshiped the god Saturn, where they did a lot of unspeakable things. And, and actually, the Christian church at the time when it first was accepted, it rejected that. It's like, no, we're not going to do that. But then eventually adopted it and said, okay, we only adopted it. You change the name and you base it around Christ. And that's when you get Christ Christmas. Christmas. Christ mass or Christmas. You see what I'm saying? So how do you take a pagan holiday that's really bad? Like I'm talking about orgies, rape, homosexuality, and all of these other different things. And you put Christ's name on it. And then you call it good. You know what I'm saying? Easter has nothing to do with the Bible. You can't find Easter in the scriptures, right? Good Friday to Easter Sunday, there's no way you can count three full days. The scriptures say that it took three full days, three days and three nights for the Messiah to come back. Easter, you can't count from Good Friday. Good Friday. Even if you use the morning, the earliest part of the day, you still can't get three days from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. Good Friday morning, right? From Good Friday morning, to Saturday morning is one full day. It's a full day and a full night, right? That's one day. Saturday morning and Sunday morning is one full day. You only get two days. There's no way to count three days from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. It's not biblical. It's not biblical at all. So you wonder why all of these things happen. And when you're looking at Easter, yeah, you get the Easter Bunny, but the origin of the Easter Bunny that's coming from Babylon, uh, Babylonian uh, influence with um, the goddess. Um, uh, I used to say it all the time. 
but she's the goddess of fertility. And supposedly um, she lays an egg in the river and produces life and all this other good stuff, right? You have that. But that's a Christian religion. Not a Christian religion. That's a Christian holiday. Coming from supposedly a monotheistic religion that has politics. Uh, like Christianity, it like it identifies, right? So it's like I'm monotheistic, but I identify as polytheistic, or I have polytheistic tendencies. You see what I'm saying? Like that don't that don't make sense. It doesn't it doesn't line up with the scriptures? However, like I said earlier, a lot of people who follow this religion, they're doing so because that's what they were taught. Um, they don't really read on their own, or if they do read, it's they're reading in a controlled environment, meaning they're following the teachings of an elder or a pastor, and they're reading what they're instructed to read, but they're also reading from a Christian mindset, a Christian perspective. Even when they read the, even when you read, for example, um, when the Messiah says, well, I came not to um, do away with the law, destroy the law, but to fulfill it, right? For not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. If you're reading that from a Christian perspective, you're, you're reading that as the law is done away with. But that's not how it reads. That's not what the Messiah said. He said he came not to do away with the law. So you see what I'm saying? So like I like that, that, that that's why it was so significant to me because once I got um once I got sent to Turkey and I was placed in an environment where all Christian influence was stripped away, I was able to think clearly and I was able to read the scriptures for what they were, right? And do the research based on that, based on context, based on translation, based on the gift of the Holy Spirit, which gave me discernment, right? To answer all of my prayers. Because if I had not had that, in, in, that, that exposure, Who's to say I still wouldn't be a Christian today? I mean, I would hope that, you know, the spirit would have led me in a different way to, to find the truth. But, you know, it took me to get away because if all of my friends were Christian, if my family was Christian, if my um, mentors, my influences are Christian, if my household is Christian, then I am surrounded on a daily basis by a Christian environment, by Christian influence. I'm in a bubble. So it's hard to think outside of the Christian mindset when that's all you know and that's all you have, right? So um, going over here, right? Like I said, keep in mind, Antioch was an ancient Greek city who worshiped pagan gods as well. So we see by context that they were called Christians first in a Greek city surrounded by Greeks. The translation of the Greek word came from the Hebrew. So they couldn't have went by a Greek name originally because they did not all speak Greek, okay? And the term Christians or Christianos were the same name given to the followers of Serapis, who to them was a sovereign God as well. See the connection? If we simply research the origins of the matter, we can determine that Christianity misinterpreted and coined a false name to identify those who worship the Messiah. Not to say that Christians of today who truly believe in and worship the Messiah are worshiping a false deity, but it is important to know the history of a name before you go by it, instead of reading the Bible at face value. Be very careful of the tools of the wicked as they are great deceivers. Bottom line is to keep the most high laws, statutes, and commandments, and the truth will be revealed to you, okay? Just like it was revealed to me. First John 2 and 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him, right? I did not research because scripture says to. I mean, I did this research because scripture says to. First Thessalonians 5 and 21. Prove all things, hold fast, which is good. Okay, I don't just take people's word for it. Somebody tells me something, I don't just accept it, right? I look into it. 
I got to prove all things. And then I hold fast. I hold on to what is good, what's correct, what's righteous, right? He that saith, I know him. So if you say you know the Messiah, you say you're a follower of the Messiah. You say you're a Christian, right? Christian supposedly means follower of the Messiah. He that saith, I know him and keep it, not his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. This isn't me calling you a liar. If you're a Christian, you don't follow the Torah. You don't keep the laws of Moses. You don't follow the example set forth by the Messiah. That's not me calling you a liar. That's the scriptures calling you a liar, okay? And I say that, and like I told you in the beginning of this video, this isn't a Christian bashing attempt, okay? This is one, bring information right because maybe you've never heard of this maybe you didn't know that this existed okay so now you're aware now you're made aware now you're held accountable right two because maybe you don't you don't understand the importance of origin or the importance of the original translation because translation can, can, can really complicate things and three it's out of love i told you i was a christian i have an affinity for christian I wish that I could reach every Christian and show them that you know, the error of this, this, this Christian doctrine, the error of teaching people that we should not have to keep the law because that creates a, a lifestyle and a culture of lawlessness. How are we supposedly followers of the Messiah, but we do not keep the Messiah's instructions. How are we following somebody? How is somebody supposedly our leader, but we don't do what they say do? We don't live how they live. You see what I'm saying? It makes no sense. Because if you're living outside of the law, okay, and we know that the law, we know what the we know the definition of sin according to 1 John 3 and 4. It says sin is a transgression of the law. Okay, so how are we living transgressing the law, which is sin? So we're sinning. How are we sinning continually? And we're using misunderstood interpretations of the scriptures to try to justify. We can't follow the Messiah who said, keep the law, and then turn around and not keep the law, but say that we're followers of the Messiah. It just doesn't work. That way. I know that's really oversimplified and it can get really. Um, a lot more in depth. And I've done videos um, in regards to like if the law has been done away with. But it's a plea for me, right? If you're a Christian, take a step back. Take off your Christian view, okay, your Christian perspective, and sit it up on the shelf and look at the scriptures, right, with new eyes. Look at the scriptures and the understanding that's within the context and the translation without your Christian bias. And then when you see what the scriptures actually say, apply it to your life and also share with others so that your brothers, your sisters, your friends, they can come to the truth as well. That's all that I want to do in regards to this topic, right? In regards to this video, the reason why I put on this presentation, not to bash it. I love it, okay? We're all channels of the time. And we all should be able to do exactly as he told us to do. So with that being said, I hope this video was edifying y'all. Hope y'all had a good time. Gotta go. Shalom, everybody.